Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel Jorgensen, uh, Managing Director of Finescape Services. Um, welcome to our, our talk about uh, regenerative viticulture uh, here today. Um, I'm here with Debbie Warner, Liz Mumkoglu, and uh, Hugo Stewart. We're all viticulturalists of a sort. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about what regenerative viticulture actually is, um, and then I'm going to do a little case study or a very short uh, demonstration of a case study we've done recently of two different sites. Um, and then we'll have a little Q&A session where we're answering a few questions, a bit of a panel. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up to questions from the audience later. So a um, little bit about Regen Viticulture. Essentially, what is it? I mean, I'm sure you probably all already know, having been in a show like this, you're all probably farmers or, or in the industry yourselves. Essentially, it is trying to mirror nature as far as possible and understanding nature and uh, trying to bring that into your vineyard or into your crop and uh, let the soil and uh, plants start to work for you and understand how those things can affect your vines or affect your crop um, and what they can do for you and, and help you. And what I'm going to talk about mostly in my case study is how that's affecting viticulture specifically how we found uh, things to practically work out in vineyards, and um, also, most importantly, the financial implications of doing that and, and what that does for your, your bottom line. So I'll jump straight into my little slideshow. Uh, it's only about 10 minutes long, so hopefully you won't all fall asleep by the end of it. A um, little brief intro uh, to our business, just to give you a bit of a background. We are Vinescapes. We're a viticultural-focused and we're winemaking-focused uh, consultancy. We also provide uh, the full ground to glass, um, ground to grape to glass solution of viticultural services. Everything from conception right through planting the vineyard, land suitability, feasibility reports, climactic reports, and then going into actually physically planting the vineyard through to managing and consultancy after that. Uh, we've got a t team of specialists, and uh, each one has their kind of uh, you know, special target within that, that realm. So I'm going to do a quick little case study or a, a very short summary of a case that we've been running for several years. Um, we, we manage roughly about 30 vineyards across the UK with all different shapes and sizes, everything from sort of half a hectare right up to 20, 30 hectares um, and everything in between. Of course, they're all um, managed in very different ways. We, we do very bespoke management. Uh, and obviously also uh, we're, we're customer facing, we're working for a client, so sometimes our hands are a little bit shackled and other clients give us free reign, which is great. What we've really found uh, is that obviously one of the most important things, as I'm sure you all know, is that a healthy soil uh, does wonders for your crop, any crop, but particularly for vines, we've really felt that uh, a healthy soil can do so much for us if it is actually truly healthy. And by what I mean by that is not just chemical health, but actually biological health and structural health. So I won't dig too much into that because I'm sure you all understand what soil health is, but essentially it's a soil that is organically created soil structure rather than chemically created soil structure or uh, mechanically created or man-made structure. So we're looking at that, that porosity and uh, the microbial life in the soil, um, things like fungi, bacteria, nematodes, etc., earthworms, all of that. If they're working well, they do a lot of jobs for you. And that's what this case study was all about. How good are those things and what are the effects on my vines? Uh, so we run two sites. For the purpose of this, we'll call them Vineyard A and Vineyard B. Um, they have a really, really similar terroir. Um, they are both on, I think, sandy loams or similar and uh, really similar climactic uh, conditions. And so the vineyards are pretty much mirror for mirror in terms of uh, topography, layout, size, um, and, and, and uh, soil type to start with. But uh, one key difference is that site A is uh, Geneva double curtain. I'll quickly flick to a picture so you can see what that looks like. Vineyard A on the uh, top left there. That's pruned to a really tall trunk, sort of one and a half meters high. And then we tee off at the top and, and split it into a double cordon where the shoots hang vertically down like a curtain, hence the name Geneva double curtain. Whereas site B is VSP, vertical shoot positioning. Um, and that's where, needless to say, as the name is on the tin, the shoots go vertically and they grow up. Now, the key difference there for the purpose of this study is row width. Uh, vineyard A has got a 3.1 meter wide row, so the tractor is far away from the trunks. And Vineyard B has a 2.1 meter wide row, 
and the same size tractor, and the tractor is driving very close to the root zone. So the difference there is that site A has got very little or no compaction in the root zone of the vines themselves. Um, and, and historically, it's never been tilled since planting a long time ago. It's never been plowed or subsoiled or cultivated uh, for very many years, probably 15, 20 years, which is great. It's had, I say, very little herbicide use. We have only done spot spraying with a tiny little uh, knapsack just on some of the noxious weeds that we don't want to take hold, things like bindweed that will start to strangle vines, etc. cetera. Um, and other than that, we allow uh, the natural plants just to come through underneath the vines. Now, because the vines are a little bit taller, we can handle a little bit of humidity and we can, we can live with it, so that's fine. And they don't seem to complete with the vines, which is brilliant. Um, we've got a really diverse natural flora mix. We didn't actually sow any cover crops because I don't believe in sowing a cover crop if you don't actually need it. Um, in that vineyard, we found there was a lot of diversity coming through, 15 to 20 different species. We thought, great, actually, they'll do the job for us. Why sow something else and spend more money on a crop that is unnecessary? Um, and importantly, we had a reactive spray program. So where conventional sites might be spraying anywhere between 10 and 15 times a year, there we might spray once or twice based on actual weather data. So we, we track the weather with um, things. Now, vineyard B is almost the opposite in terms of management style. The owner wanted it immaculate in his view. Um, he wanted it short crop golf course type grass between the rows. He wanted every vine to look identical and he wanted them sprayed till they are glowing bright yellow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it looks very tidy and that's perhaps what historically what, what conventional farmers would be after. So we did it that way. That's what, that's what they wanted. It was weed free under vine um, and a very synthetic nutrition program. Lots of uh, you know, products on the leaves and lots of fungicides. That site might be sprayed 12, 15 times a year. Again, recap of the pictures there, so you can just see what I'm talking about, site A and B. Now, our approach generally is that we take a regenerative approach as far as possible, and that's kind of our default, unless the clients kind of push us in the opposite direction, in which case we'll keep persuading them <laughs> as far as we can. So we monitor the ground conditions and soil structure very closely, um, and we want to understand and monitor and uh, really understand how healthy that soil actually is. Um, and we've been doing that for a number of years. Now, the averages start to become very interesting where site uh, A, which has been sympathetically managed, lots of earthworms, an average of 26. Sometimes we get sort of 50, 60, 70 worms in a, in a single spade full of soil, which is phenomenal. Uh, whereas site B, half that on average over the years. So much, much, much less activity in the ground. And that's a really good indicator that site B is struggling with compaction, etc. Site A on the VEST test of this is a, a visual evaluation of soil structure where we're looking at, at how the aggregates are formed. Uh, site, site A has got a, what we call a mixed bobbly crumb. I'm sure most of you probably heard the terminology, but um, so that's a, a organically created structure compared to site B, which uh, on average has had really large angular blocks of essentially bricks of soil under the ground. Uh, no porosity, no uh, springiness, and no, um, no pores, no holes for things to move, particularly water and nutrients, et cetera. Um, spadeability, very technical term there. Essentially, that's a measure of compaction. That's how I walk around and just you know, stab it in the ground. If I can stand on it, spadeability is good or easy. If it takes me several jumps, then spadeability is hard. That's, that's my technical way of measuring compaction. I'm sure there are better ways. Um, we always found site A super easy, site B really, really hard. Now they have only a little bit more traffic in site B, but the soil's been poorly managed for a number of years and it is struggling. So in summary, really healthy soil, pretty much dead soil. Now what does that do? Oh, sorry, um, looking at the soil structure, so we so spoke about that bobbly crumb. Picture on the left, you can see lots of kind of almost cottage cheesy texture or breadcrumb type texture where you've got lots of little holes, lots of round, um, kind of groupings and aggregates of soil where they clump together, that's an obvious sign that that soil was biologically created. So it was created by the so whole soil food web, sticking those aggregates together, gluing the aggregates together, and that is generating that nice porosity that we've got there. Site B, you'll see same soil type, but very, very different uh, structure. There's no porosity there. You can't see many holes going through it. And you can't see, uh, you, you can quite obviously see that it's quite compacted in those layers. 
below that, uh, each of the pictures, you just see our earthworm counts. So we do a lot of recording on an app called Sector Mental, which has been really useful for, for us as contractors because uh, it means that we can gather our data and analyze it very, very efficiently. Sector Mental have got a stand somewhere here. I'm very happy to support them because their apps are brilliant. Um, and those are just uh, a demonstration of the earthworm counts over time and things like that. So our approach, what did we do with site B? Obviously site A, we just leave it as is, it's doing really well. And uh, what we found with uh, site A and B, something I didn't mention before, was that the yields in site A were always very consistent. They were a nice seven to eight ton a hectare, very comfortable, and interestingly, the feedback from all of the, the wineries were always, wow, where did that fruit come from? And every year we started to realize, oh, well, all of the regen sites that we managed, the fruit was from, the fruits that the winemakers were commenting on was always from a regen site. And we thought, well, there's got to be something in that. And this is why. The soil was healthy, the vines were healthy, and things worked better. So site B um, obviously is now on a journey of recovery. We finally convinced the owner that uh, a golf course between the rows is not healthy. Uh, we sowed, uh, in this example, we were struggling with the compaction. So to decompact, we used a, a soil improving uh, brassica mix, which actually was not me being creative. That was Cotswold Seeds, got it on the shelf, and it's actually brilliant. Works really, really well. The uh, brassicas and the tillage radish in there, lots of phacelia, mustard, etc. Those plants did the subsoiling for us. So they decompacted those rows for us very, very quickly, meant that we didn't need to. Um, cultivate or subsoil or break up that, that hard pan or that structure. So it was a way of actually getting the soil to be improved without using heavy machinery. So we're not undoing nature's goodness, we're just promoting it to do it quicker. These were all so sowed with a no-till drill between the alleyways uh, so as not to disturb that, that, ungood, um, that good structure. We bought a lighter tractor uh, because inevitably we were driving on those same tram lines over and over again. That light tractor uh, just meant that we've got a little bit less compaction. We decreased the pressure in the tires and um, we reduced our spray program step by step, slowly but slowly, surely. Rather than going cold turkey, we reduced it with a, a targeted approach. We put some weather stations in and that allowed us to uh, confidently reduce the spray programs step by step. We added lots of compost, so we wanted to spread a bit more carbon to increase the carbon stocks in the soil slowly. Lots of compost actually mixed with a bit of muck just to balance the carbon to nitrogen. Um, and that really helped to improve the fertility of the soil as well. Bit of a quick boost. <coughs> and we're looking forward to seeing how that site goes, really, over, over the time. So far, uh, this was actually just over a year ago. And uh, we, we found that since then, we dug down, looked at the tests, and we're starting to see 30 to 35 earthworms in a single spadeful where it was about 13, 14 before. So it, it is already starting to improve. And all we did was sow a cover crop, put some compost down, and start to reduce our sprays. So I guess the key message there from a viticultural perspective is it can easily be done. And um, also that actually with all of these really minor tweaks in, in the management practices on this site, we found that we were able to reduce costs and reduce inputs and have a more consistent yield. So this was just a case study of two sites, but actually we managed so many that we've, we've tested this on others. And we've always found that the, the sites that we're managing regeneratively have got a higher and more consistent yield, more importantly with better flavor, so wines that people actually want to buy, and um, their input costs are actually reduced. So all in all, it's a, a really positive message really for regen farming, and a, a true example on a practical level that it genuinely works, which is nice to see. So that's it from me, really. It's just to say that this can be done. I'll now hand over to um, Debbie Warner, who uh, is from the Wild Wine School, and uh, she'll open up a panel of questions. Um, hi, so I'm Debbie Warner, uh, founder of Wild Wine School. We're a wine school um, specializing in education on sustainability in wine. Um, thanks, Joel. That was incredible. So nice to see a real life kind of comparison of two sites. Um, so before we get started, I thought it'd be interesting to know who's out there, a little bit about you. So just a show of hands. Who is actually involved in viticulture? Who grows grapes at the moment? Cool. A few of you. And um, are any of you already working regeneratively? Great. Excellent. Anyone else? No, cool. Anyone looking to move to a more kind of regenerative approach? Hey, excellent. Um, and are there any of you out there who aren't currently growing um, grapes, but would like to include that as part of your farm? 
Cool, excellent. So that's nice. It means that we can hopefully tailor some of the answers towards um, giving you some advice, maybe, because I'm sure these guys have learnt lots of lessons in their time. Um, so firstly, I'll introduce Liz. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Trevibbon Mill? Hello. Um, so my name's Liz Momjuolu. Myself and my husband, uh, Engin, own a 25-acre uh, farm, it's large small holding, small farm, uh, just outside of Padstow in North Cornwall, which we purchased in 2007, actually not to plant a vineyard. We initially um, aimed to buy just six and a half acres with a ruined water mill, a fishing lake, some ancient woodland. It was going to be our second home. And then the, we made this mistake when the farmer who was selling his parents' much larger farm offered us 19 acres of um, very barren fields. And we decided to buy it. We still don't know quite why we did that. Uh, we're in a valley where we um, goes down to a stream called the Issy Brook, uh, which uh, which ends up into the Camel Estuary, uh, which is an SSSI. Um, so after doing the paperwork, we, we returned to what we'd bought, and uh, we realized we'd bought 19 acres of the worst farmland for miles around. We're on slate there. We've got very shallow soil. Um, in my head, it was going to be a, a large garden around our watermill, but uh, a year later, um, we ordered 11,000 vines, and we've now got uh, a vineyard. This year, we've actually planted another 1,000 acres. Um, we've got very shallow soil, so challenges, uh, you know, lots of challenges in the way we grow, and it's Cornwall, it's quite a damp climate. Um, we went into soil association conversion Im immediately. I'd always had allotments and done a lot of gardening, so that was the way I gardened. Um, we'll talk a little bit later, perhaps, about how we went away and regenerated. We've got sheep as well. You've possibly just seen that. We've, we've uh, now got a winery uh, bar. We've got two bars and a restaurant. We're three miles from Padstow, so we're also now a hospitality business. Completely changed our lives. Um, Sometimes in a bad way, but uh, mostly in a good way. Um, and, uh, yeah, is that fine yeah, as, a as a starting case? There you Brilliant. And then, Hugo, do you want to tell us a bit about Domain Hugo? Yes. Um, I started farming um, in a, on a small family farm um, in, the, in, the, in the 70s. And um, I used to breed pigs. I did that until 2020. Um, we ended up with some disease problems and I got rather fed up with always looking after livestock. And I took a year out and went to France where I'd bought um, a ruin in the, in the hills, the, uh, the lower hills of the, of the Pyrenees and the Corbier Hills. And a friend of mine who trained as a retrained as a winemaker, this is his second career, came to stay and fell in love with the area. And long and short of it was, um, we set up... Um, a, a winery and um, and we bought vines, old vines, and a lot of them, um, the um, the vines had just been massively sprayed in just before bud burst in in the sort of late winter with glyph glyphosate, and there was there was no growth whatsoever in the in the vineyard, and the rivulets or ravines almost in in some of them where the you know, the, the, the sort of flash flooding was just pouring out. So w we instantly, obviously, didn't we did nothing, and things things started to grow, and we got rid of the rivulets, and um, the 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 soil started to to taste or not taste well. You can taste it, right? Um, smell much better, um, and so that that was. And our, one of our neighbours was an organic farmer, um, and th that sort of set set me off on the on the path of being organic and regenerative. I, I left the business, um, which is still carrying on, in 2015, and in 2016 I planted um, in, in Wiltshire, which I'm just south of Salisbury, on the south-facing chalk downland, um, and went straight into being organic and biodynamic. I was very nervous about doing so in this country, um, because obviously a very different climate to the south of France. But strangely, it's actually been, been easier because basically it's much colder. Um, whereas in France, in, in, the, in the spring, the summer, if you get a downpour, it's really warm and you can get an explosion of, of mildew. In this country, um, you know, if it gets down to 
10 degrees and you have no more than um, 10 millimeters of, of, uh, of, of rain, uh, um, then you've not really got too much of a, much of a problem um, uh, with, 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 with disease. And that's what I found. And also just being organic. Um, I was, everybody was saying, well, it w won't work in this country. You've got, you've got your hands tied behind your back. But uh, that's not been the case, and we've got a winery on the farm, and that, the, um, th that does contract winemaking for a lot of other people, and we've, we've actually converted quite a few people to being regenerative and organic, and that, that, that whole different approach. So... Um, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I think um, that's a really good introduction to why you've chosen to go for a, a regenerative organic approach. Um, Liz, what led you to going for a regenerative approach at Trevibbon? Um, I think we, because we had no farming background, um, I've got a degree in physics, I've got a master's in radiation biophysics, I worked in that health service doing radiation protection, my husband's an economist. Um, we, we sort of happened to buy some land and so we had no um, family history of how we should be farming the land that we bought. And so for us, it was very much uh, lack of knowledge, uh, lack of equipment and resources. But we just wanted it to be a place we wanted to be in. And uh, we never wanted a monoculture. Um, I've seen so many vineyards that are just, you know, straight lines of vines, uh, glyphosated underneath, nothing else growing. So uh, we set about... Um, allowing nature to take over. So we have a lot of, uh, our, our, one of our biggest weeds, if you like, where we are is um, wild mustard. So again, that's a brassica. And so we allow that a lot of the time to come up. We've got a lot of clover. We've got very shallow soils. So we couldn't actually deep plow even if we wanted to. So that meant that it sort of helped us along that regenerative route because we're not tilling hardly hardly at all because we're just bringing up shillet and more slate um, we planted an apple orchards as well we've got 1700 apple orchards which is still in organic certification we make ciders um, we hardly touch the apple orchards they're left to their own devices and there was a one of the slides you showed is we found in our main apple orchard now uh, I keep going um, the, uh, the next no, next one uh, that, that one, that one. So what we found is we've just got um, an understory of plantain now, ribwort, and it's it's completely out-competed the grasses. So we're trying to encourage that. We get loads of pollinators in there. It's just a fab fabulous place. So we're trying to encourage those native and natural plants to come up within the vineyard as well. Um, we're not into sowing. We're not, not sort of adding any other species in there. We did have some phacelia in... Um, an area which actually this year we've now planted with another thousand vines. Uh, we've got uh, sheep on site. We bring the sheep into the vineyard. They're South Downs. They come into the vineyard in the autumn and winter. So we're not cutting. They're, they're for us, they're not not there as a commercial flock. They're there to cut old grass. Uh, so we don't have to use the tractor in the winter and the autumn. You know, in Cornwall, the grass sometimes grows all year because we don't go below 10 centigrade. Um, so the sheep have done a great job, and they're also adding a little bit of uh, manure. Um, and it's just a place we wanted to be, and that's I think that's where our... We, we didn't realise that we were regeneratively farming um, until only recently. And I, everything I read, I said, well, that's what we're doing. That is the way we farm. And now when people come onto the site, they come to have wine tastings or tours or, or just a drink of wine or cider, uh, people's faces light up. Um, they come down our path from our, our quite sort of poor gateway. And as they walk around and they see the amount of wildflowers and, and just what we've got there, I see all the customers' faces light up because it is such a beautiful environment to work in. And I don't, I don't see how you could farm in any other way. It is really. such a beautiful, it's beautiful place. If yeah. anyone's ever in Cornwall, definitely recommend <laughs> going to visit. Um, yeah, so magical. And actually, Hugo, your place is magical as well. I think often regeneratively farmed. Yes, I mean, just, just to give you a bit, bit more background, I, when I planted the first vineyard in 2016, that was into a field, small field, which um, ha had been uh, left fallow because my daughter was going to grow organic herbs in it, but it never, never happened. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I just let that regenerate naturally. 
and I did um, after after a while I, pl I did pl put in some white clover and some yellow trefoil the second vineyard had been um, been farmed in the conventional way and actually on the soil analysis it was much more depleted of minerals um, than the than the first one so th uh, in that instance I did I did plant a multi-species cover crop now um, it was um, I mean, the, 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 the sort of the perceived w wisdom going back a few years was not to have any competition with your newly planted vines, uh, which in some sense makes, makes sense. But with the second vineyard, um, th I was not happy with the state of the soil, and I was prepared to maybe for the, for the vines to take a little bit longer to get established because I really wanted that soil structure and, and the life in the soil uh, to really start building up. And the first two years, the, the and it's partly because of the periods of drought, the first two years, the, the, the vines did struggle. But suddenly, now, um, this year, they've really taken off. And I, and I, I feel quite sure in myself that that's, put, that's partly, or mainly due to the fact that the, the, so the soil health has improved and we've got a lot of biodiversity and uh, I can't believe how how much the um, the multi-species crop is you know can go up to then you have to have to mow it we another thing um, rather like is we do have sheep in the winter we put sheep in in the more established vineyard we put sheep in um, in in the autumn and well, after harvest and then up until about the end of um, the end of February and the end of March. Um, I would really love to put them in the new vineyard, but every time I've tried, they tend to f uh, hit, hit, they don't break the vines, but they, they sort of rub up against them and they, they, they're, instead of being upright, they're all leaning over, so you have to spend your life pulling them up straight, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's, but, I'm, but I'm really looking forward to them getting a bit stronger. I'm also, um, changing um, the sheep by getting some new lambs as opposed to older um, uh, sheep. So that th these are, these are they're too big, they're too big. So um, now with um, with the breed of our Shropshire sheep, and we'll be putting some new lambs in, uh, probably twice the twice the number that we're using at the moment, um, about about twelve to fifteen a hectare, um, and um, I hope that'll. That'll um, uh, we'll be able to get them into the newer vineyard sooner. We'll see. Nice, thanks. Um, so, Joel, I know we have lots of people in the audience who are thinking about planting vines. Um, when someone calls you up and says, "Hey, we'd like to plant a vineyard," um, what's the first thing you do? How do you assess the health of the land and um, the suitability for growing vines? And then, how do you prepare the site for viticulture? Okay, so um, from our perspective, the most important part is obviously climate, um, because soil can be changed, soil can be fixed, So, and most soil types, not all, but most soil types are suitable for vineyards. So we'd actually start with a, a climactic assessment, which um, my business partner, Alistair, who's a climatologist and viticulturalist, so a unique set of skills um, and quite research-led, he developed something called VineMap, uh, which can very, uh, it can assess your climactic situation from any field right down to a very granular um, uh, space. So I think it's 20 square meters. And he can assess the full grain degree days, frost risk, etc. full climactics. Then moving on from that, we do a, a physical site assessment where we would start to look at the soils. And depending on what we find, um, the condition of those soils is how we would then base our, our um, amelioration strategy. So if we found, for example, that the soil was uh, historically very arable, heavy farmed, been ploughed often or cultivated, etc. and the structure is perhaps not quite great, then we would, to be honest, we would plant the very traditional conventional way, prep the land, uh, break it up, use a machine planter and plant. Now that's a very anti-regen way of planting a vineyard, but it's uh, quite a cost-effective approach. However, if we get to a site and perhaps it was uh, slightly neglected pasture land or similar and not heavily intensively farmed and we find that actually after digging some profile pits uh, pits that the soil condition is very good then we might consider hand planting so we would do almost zero ground prep 
um, we would still do the chemical analysis and the um, s digging of soil pits and assessing the soils. And if they're good, we might just plant straight in by hand, uh, straight into the grass, and then manage it from there. And that way, we're not we're not undoing all of the good structure that's been developed over the last you know few years or decades. Um, and it's a it's it's not actually drastically more expensive because you're avoiding all of that heavy ground prep, which is a lot of heavy machinery. And so, yes, it's more expensive to physically plant the vines, but you're avoiding a lot of the ground prep and your vineyard is going to get off to a better start in life. Fantastic. Thanks. And I think one way um, you've said th um, that we can encourage or move towards a more regenerative approach and have better health of soils and the whole ecosystem is encouraging biodiversity. So, um, Liz, how do you encourage biodiversity at Trevibbon? What do you do? And is it something you monitor? Um, I think just by allowing a, a lot more, um, not having that monoculture, al allowing um, the the wildflowers to come up, uh, and, ma and maybe actually adding, like the phacelia obviously wasn't wild in Cornwall, we, we sowed that. Um, but the minute you start sort of adding new species or allowing new species of plants, you then start seeing a lot more wildlife. So we had 19 acres of completely barren fields that had just been sprayed off um, over the years to get rid of ducks and, and, and thistles. And all our local neighbours kept saying to me the first few years, all the local farmers, oh, Liz, you've got to spray, you've got to get rid of those ducks, you've got to get rid of your thistles because all the seeds are going to come to my field. And, and we ignored them. <laughs> so, uh, well, they're still all there because the sheep don't like those things. They like the ducks but not the thistles. Um, so by allowing a lot of the native plants to, to flower, you're bringing the insects, uh, so many uh, different types of bumblebees we have. We just can't believe how noisy our, our vineyard is in the, in the summer. Um, lots of flocks of birds we have now, which we never saw in the first few years. Flocks of goldfinches. Uh, we have buzzards overhead. Um, down we even have little egrets come to our site because they get lost from the camelos tree. Um, We've got stoats, we've got weasels, we've even seen polecats. Um, just all sorts, we've got snakes, you know, adders and grass snakes. It's, it's just amazing, actually, what you, what you can see um, going from a completely barren site to just allowing nature to, to do its thing and, and, and trying to be careful in the way you farm. Um, yeah, appreciating your land is, is part of that regenerative farming, I think. Lovely. And Hugo, how about you? How do you encourage biodiversity and is it something that you, you're measuring? Well, um, we, as I said, we, we, we planted, uh, well you, you, just let, you just have to um, just let nature do it I itself, you know. Lots nice. And the trouble is a lot of people who plant vineyards want them all neat and tidy and that's the worst thing. Nature isn't neat and tidy. You know, you, you, li you leave all the verges to just and all around the edges and uh, to to just grow and um, it's it's amazing what what uh, what comes up it is really extraordinary and, and we've 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 got a lot of birds now we've got uh, we've got some nesting uh, um, w wild quail and there are only about 350 um, pairs in this country and they've we suddenly found we got two pairs um, so it's really rather like you were saying, you know, it's really fascinating to see what just happens naturally and not to make everything neat and tidy. But I think one thing that's common to both of your vineyards as well is that you have left a lot of land to nature. So you haven't just planted huge, huge fields of vines. There is space yep. in between with hedgerows and with, yeah, space yeah, for... We have, uh, yeah, we have a lot of um, Cornish hedges, uh, so traditional Cornish uh, slate walls with... Uh, you know, the hedgerow on the top. But we've also got about two acres of um, temperate rainforest down in the valley. So we've got a lot of oak really old oak trees, sort of six or 700 years old. We've got aspens, we've got lots of willow and, and lots of um, ferns, na natural, f you know, native ferns. I used to go to Hampton Court Flower Show and buy ferns for my <laughs> London garden. And now I've, I've got them just growing wild. And it's just, yeah leaving them, making sure you don't get rid of those things and appreciating what you've got. It's just, yeah. Nice. Um, and Joel, obviously you are working with clients. So I imagine that 
um, they're often looking at cash and the bottom line and making sure they can make enough money and make sure their vineyards are profitable. Um, do you encourage them to allow space for biodiversity or for nature to just take its its course and do its thing? Yeah, abs absolutely we do um, because obviously we are working for clients and, and as such we have to be results driven. And if I'm honest, we've, we've often found that by farming in a regen way, we've actually delivered better results. So if we can encourage our, our clients to allow a little space for wildfire strips that, that perhaps aren't suitable to grow right in between the alleyways because perhaps they grow too tall and, and, and increase humidity. Um, so we would then ask them to set aside a little bit of land and, and often they do it in a stewardship scheme or, or through wildflower, uh, you know, meadows, etc. So yes, we, we encourage that actively and, and don't try and maximise your, your crop in that field because actually you, you can optimise it uh, rather than maximising it. And what we, what we found was actually when you do try and maximise your crop in that field is you end up getting very large peaks and troughs uh, in your yields. And... Um, to be honest, that's that's really hard from a, a business perspective. Of course, when you're turning that fruit into wine, you need you know more or less tank space, and then when your marketing team is selling that fruit, they need you know uh, more or less uh, clients and, and, and restaurants etc. to to buy that wine. So actually, by by having a more uh, diverse field and, and regen farming, you end up with a much more stable crop, and then that makes every step of the business much more linear rather than massive peaks and troughs, and that's actually better for you know, for planning and everything else. Great, thanks. And Joel, how do you encourage soil health in the vineyards that you work with? Uh, to be honest, do as, do as little as possible. <laughs> it's the easy answer. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, we do um, on a practical level. So we, we try and have smaller tractors. We try and use tracked tractors, which are lower compaction because we are driving on the same tram lines, you know, very often. Um, we try and drive the tractor as infrequently as we can. We never ever drive on wet soils unless we absolutely have to. Um, and we minimize our spray programs as much as we can. So we're, we're very um, data-driven decision makers because we have to be so that we can back up what we're telling our clients and what we're doing. We follow the weather stations very closely. We don't spray unless we are absolutely confident that we're going to get disease. And even then it would be bioproducts rather than synthetic uh, pesticides. And we're very, very confident in what we do. So we reduce them uh, step by step as and when we know that it's safe to do so. Generally, we find, I mean, at the moment, on average, most of our sites we've sprayed once, maybe twice this year and only with bioproducts. And they're all still spotless. Whereas if we followed the agronomist spray program, we'd be on spray seven or eight by now. And of course, that affects the bottom line as well. <laughs> so um, back to sort of soil health. So reducing pesticides, reducing compaction, using plants to do the job for you. And that's that's the easiest answer as well, is that a subsoiler, yes, it can decompact and it might last, you know, four, five, six months, sure. Um, but plants can do it and it will last much, much, much longer and keep doing it for you every time you drive over them, they'll then keep decompacting. Um, so use plants to your advantage rather than keep seeing them as the enemy. Nice. And Liz um, and Hugo, is there anything you do differently or anything you'd like to add to what Joel's saying for creating healthy soils? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that I really like the idea of sheep because they're either c um, it, it means that y you're going into spring with um, very low grass, so you don't have to mow it or do anything for it for quite a while. Um, and also, it's the fertility. You know, it, it's it's just seems a very natural thing to to do, um, and it, it's it's a it's a win-win situation. I mean, I know some people, it, it, it's, it, it's difficult because they don't want to look after sheep. And we've got, a, we've got another flock, commercial flock on the farm anyway. And the shepherd, um, if I've got a problem with my own sheep, he'll sort them. Um, so that, that makes life easier. But I, I can understand that in your situation, it not, might not be always very easy, and not a very easy option. But I, I do like that. And people... People, you know, really comment on it, and it it um, it sort of it enhances somehow. It enhances the whole vineyard. I can't really put words to it, but it sort of seems a natural thing to do. Yeah, it, it adds more life to your vineyard, and uh, sheep give us an awful lot of trouble. Or sheep do, and uh, my husband insists that when, when we close our bar in sort of mid December. Uh, we don't open again until February half term, and he just opens the gates and uh, the internal gates, and he allows the sheep to uh, free free graze on the whole 
28-odd acres. And uh, it means I have to go around and move all the sheet puddles to protect all my, all my flowers. Um, but, but it's a lovely thing to see, to, to see them just like wandering anywhere and, and everywhere. And so, yeah, they can be a bit of a pain, but it's a lovely, I agree, it, it's nice. And it adds that life into your farm. Um, yeah, about soils, a, a lot of uh, viticulturists um, want these clean, empty strips under the vines. And uh, we've never been able to achieve that in Cornwall anyway. Um, but we, we've never used herbicides, so that wouldn't be an option for us. Um, and many years ago, if you remember, Jill, I don't know if you were in the UK at that point, but um, the UK got some funding from the EU for something called Wine Skills. It's something that Joe, your colleague, did a lot of work for. And we were lucky enough to, um, to be awarded some of that funding. And part of that was, um, there was, a, there was a very famous Australian viticulturist called Peter Hayes. And he came to the UK over several years. And we got him, I think, for half a day or a day, a few times a year. And the first few times he came to visit us, he kept saying, well, listen, Engin, you, you've got to clear up these weeds under the vine. You've got to rip down, down your inter row and, and do all this cultivation. And um, we did it once just to please him. Actually, he made us put the equipment on the tractor and he wanted to see us doing it there and then. And then we just stopped doing it because we felt that it wasn't the way we wanted to work. And he came back one August, a few years later, and he we were having terrible weather in the UK, absolute downpours of rain, and I think this is something that we've seen again recently. And he'd been in the southeast of England where most of the vineyards at that time were like clear, empty strips under the vines. And uh, he'd seen what damage that was doing. There's really heavy downpours of rain that had just, um, you know, gone into that empty strip of soil, and the grapes we were we were heading towards harvest, so the grapes were actually swelling, and and splitting, and and he'd actually seen that, and he came to us and he said, "Do you know, Liz?" He said, "For once, I actually think you've done the right thing, leaving that those plants under your vines, because in in Cornwall particularly, you know, August can be quite wet. It's when the tourists come." Uh, and it's always it's always heavy rain, um, and so it, it made me feel so much better that we we'd gone against what everyone was telling us to do in the way that we were farming. Um, but actually, so now people are going back. Are, are actually now suggesting we that we leave a little bit of um, plant life under our vines. Um, so you've just got to you've got to farm the way it feels right for you, and and not always. That old wisdom is, is the best, I, I think, and, and a ch changing climate. Um, I, I've also had allotments, and, and when I first started allotmenting, um, all the books about growing vegetables on allotments were written by a much older generation, generally of men, that wanted to grow vegetables to put in the local show. So they were growing like giant onions and giant leeks. And if, you want, if you're a cook or you like eating, that is not the way you want to grow vegetables, you know. <laughs> so it's not always written in the textbooks that it's correct. It's just worked for them at the time. But what works for us now and in a, in a changing climate is going to, you know, we, sh we should be doing things differently. And yeah. Perfect. And that leads me on nicely to my next question, which is, uh, yeah, how do you manage the cool kind of wet marginal climate of England and also, as you say, climate change? So I think we've heard a little bit about Trevibbon. Uh, but maybe interesting to hear, Hugo, um, you kind of touched on that, the difference between here and the south of France. Yeah, well, um, <coughs> how do I manage it? When, when I first started in England, I, I was, because we're organic, so we n it was nothing synthetic, but there are basically two things we, we use. Is we use uh, sulfur and we use a tiny amount of copper. Um, because I'm becoming more confident about and being able to keep on top of any disease or not having any disease, I'm now um, I have no problem with using sulphur whatsoever because there's a deficit of sulphur in the soil. Um, copper is not a good thing, and uh, I haven't used any copper this year, and I probably won't unless we have a really bad problem. Um, I've been using some uh, compost teas. I've, I've been using um, horsetail teas, 
and some um, because cause we got an, an AND deficiency, I've been using nettle teas, and I, I, I what inspired me to do this in particular was there's a there's a vineyard in in Wales where you know they have a reputation for for um, you know ha having a lot of rain. Uh, and uh, it was Anchor Hill Vineyard, and, and they hadn't been using anything other than um, teas which they made themselves, and they've not had any any disease, and so that was quite encouraging. So um, I think uh, as one gets more confident, then I'm 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 just taking my hand off the off the accelerator more and more, and 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 I think it's you sense it, you know, if you g if you get. Um, a, a still, um, rather humid evening, which might encourage um, mildew. Then, then you know that that's the time to put something on. And even if you can put tiny amounts of copper on, um, it, it's all to do with prevention rather than cure. Because um, you know it's like a human. You know you you want to avoid having the problem. So and and also pl I mean the main thing is plant health. So if the plant is healthy, so we, p we spray on um, s w um, seaweed extracts, um, we, we spray on a bit of magnesium, a bit of zinc um, in, in natural form, and um, it, it's keeping the plant healthy, that is the key. Great. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I want to make sure that we've still got some time for questions at the end. So um, I'm going to do a quick fire to you all. Um, so I'm going to ask you each, um, what's been your greatest success? So Joel, do you want to tell us what your greatest success has been? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure, really. Um, probably Vineyard B in that uh, slideshow where we actually managed to turn it around from a vineyard that was frequently getting sick as soon as we stopped spraying it was getting ill um, and uh, now we finally brought it to a point where we've we've almost probably somewhere between a half and a quarter of the original spray program size uh, and cost um, and that's probably one of our biggest successes is, is replicating that kind of approach on several sites and uh, to be honest I think probably the biggest success was learning how to communicate this to the clients and convince them to let us do it um, Amazing. but yeah results driven through Perfect. that. Yeah. Lovely, thanks. Uh, Hugo, your greatest well, success? Well, I think it's actually just happened this last few weeks. We've got the, the vineyard we planted in 2020. Uh, as I said, it was fairly depleted. The soil was fairly depleted and um, we planted uh, a cover crop. And I sort of knew that that might impede um, the, the growth of the, of, of, of the vines. So is, is, is planting a cover crop um, the, the question I have in my mind is, is it a competition uh, against the vines or as we're learning more and more with all the, the, the interest in soil biology and mycorrhiza and fungi and, and all the exudates, w is it actually helping as opposed to being competition? And, you know, it's a very open question that. Um, and now, after two years of, of them struggling and the soil really getting getting some life into it, they've just shut up. Lovely. And Liz, you um, I think I've probably said that already. It was uh, our biggest success for me is going from that completely barren land in 2008 and seeing the biodiversity that we have there now is really lovely. But we also, a couple of years ago, had a, um, a team from Exeter University came and did um, a, a, pollin a pollinator survey of the vineyard. And I was hoping that they'd give us lots of advice on what we could do next. And, and, and they, when they sent us the, uh, the report, they basically said we were doing everything that they would have said, and there was nothing else that they told us. And, and the amount of insects that they, that they counted, I can't remember the actual results, but I think it's on our website. But yeah, so that's, that's a really big success, I think. Amazing. Um, okay, and then one, quickly each, one uh, biggest challenge that you've overcome. Liz, do you want to go first on this one? Um, biggest, well, I think there's more than one. Um, I think, uh, yeah, mildew is a big challenge, and and in the UK generally, but in in Cornwall, you know, we are we are, you know, going to be the worst worst place. So uh, that is a bit of a challenge. But we're we've learning now. We, we took out one variety of grapes um, that that got mildew for us. That was Bacchus, um, and um, We've just planted an acre this year of uh, 
a, a more disease resistant variety so so that's one challenge uh, the other challenge is getting to the point that you're actually making money uh, and I'm not the business person here so that's my husband and uh, yeah uh, it's selling your wines selling selling your wines so that is such an important and it's been uh, yeah for me as someone that like being outside and, and growing the things uh, the fruit and, and veg actually having to do the hospitality and the the business side was probably the challenge for me mm -hmm. uh, but not my husband because that's his thing I think although we've both decided from this year we're going we're back doing the viticulture we're back in the vineyard again because the business side is is running itself now fantastic okay. thanks um Hugo well I think the main thing is getting having enough labor at the right time to do things in a timely fashion this this year has been a bit of a nightmare because um, everything was late. We were two, three lates with uh, weeks late with bud burst, and then now we're about two weeks forward. So everything has been concertinaed. Everything's happened at once, and uh, we've 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 been a bit slow about about keeping up with that growth. So I think I think um, getting the get doing things in a timely way is is a, is a big challenge. Great, thanks. Joel? That's right. Yeah, type timing is everything in a vineyard. I'd say in a nutshell, my biggest challenge is probably people, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Staff, absolutely. Um, but uh, I'm at risk of offending people here, but agronomists. Um, very often, obviously, first and foremost, salesmen. And they push a lot of products onto us. And I have a really hard time convincing my clients that it's safe to not spray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that I've seen that slide, that, that's a slide um, I took, and it's actually in France. But, but the reason it's there is that this, this guy is an organic farmer. He's actually into cropping, and those are potatoes. So cool. Um, and he's doing that quite a lot. And I think that's, that's a really interesting thing to be doing because it's improving the health of the soil. It's creating another crop. And it's just uh, it's, um, it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Um, and I think linking back to what you were saying before is what are you trying to create? Are you trying to create a monoculture or are you trying to create a productive ecosystem that can provide more than one crop, I guess? Um, so I think we've got about five, ten minutes. So we'll open the floor for questions. And we've got a mic. So if you can just wait until the mic's in front of you um, until you speak. But let's go for this guy with the blue shirt, I think, was first up. Oh, either. <laughs> Two of us with blue shirts. Right. Um, I was just—it's it, fascinating that you're l doing sort of um, cover crops and having animals graze and encouraging birds. But surely, does that not affect the crop? Is there not a, an issue there with browsing of the crop of the of the grapes? Um, how does that affect the yields then? If you've got l loads okay. of extra animals all eating um, around it. So, um, if I know that, is that, is that one? Um, th there is a big problem in the UK. Uh, of starlings, flocks of starlings, and the southeast, I think, has that problem. In Cornwall, so far, fingers crossed, uh, we uh, we don't see starlings till about the fifth of November. And in all the years we've been growing grapes in Cornwall, we've always picked by then. We've always harvested. The only uh, th the little goldfinches don't seem to be affecting our crop at all. Um, and uh, the, we have a little bit of a problem with a couple of blackbirds coming from the hedgerow. Uh, they, they'll always p pick off your, you know, ripest grapes. But blackbirds are not in flocks, though. They're in pairs. And so it's a very small amount of damage. Um, I think where people have got f a lot of pheasants around, if you're in an area where there's been a lot of, a lot of shoots, shoots, pheasants seem to be uh, m more of a problem because they'll jump up and eat the bunches. Um, we've had a little bit of possibly fox eating of those, but it hasn't been a problem for us, uh, really. No, I mean, w w it's, it's not been a problem for us. We've got quite a, f quite a lot of hares, and I think that um, when you've got n when you've got bare soil and you and you've got and you've got your the trunk, then the only thing that they can eat is the trunk. But if you've got if, if the so your 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 whole vineyard is is covered in uh, different sorts of plants, um, then y you can hardly see the trunks anyway. But um, it, it's, um, there they go. Um, it's, it's not an issue, to be honest. Um, but we don't have a problem with birds. Um, do you net? We don't no, net. No, no, we don't no, net. no. Some, some vineyards do net, but we don't do that. No. 
We we sometimes net, but we also use birds of prey and 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 owl boxes and things like that to try and encourage birds to scare away the other birds. Yeah, yeah we have buzzards in in the valley where we are a lot yeah. of them. So yeah, I mean we we put some we got some kestrels nesting just a few meters from where this was taken uh, this year, and they've got f three chicks, and maybe yeah. they'll sort the problem out. <laughs> nice. And um, the other blue shirt. Is that on? Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Um, we farm a 40 hectare site down in Hampshire and we've had a very, I'm sorry, radical, but a, a, diff a shifted mentality where rather than seeing us having 40 acres of vines, the footprint of the vines is probably only about 10 hectares of that 40. The footprint of with interroads and such like, and headlands um, is looking at the, the estate in its entirety um, where the vine is only photosynthetically active for a period of the year is what can we do from an agroecological perspective to enrich that soil, but also from an additional financial, financial stream through CSS schemes, how can it actually have a positive financial kickback for us as well, in addition to it being agroecologically agro beneficial? Alice, um, sorry. <laughs> Joel, sorry, I think maybe one one for you. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Good question. So, are you, are you thinking specifically sort of intercropping, as in using that land to crop something else? Be it winter cover cropping, be it nectar flower mixes, be it yeah. whatever mm -hmm. land that would otherwise not be financially accruing, mm. one can actually use it for biodiversity reasons or agroecological reasons, mm. coupled mm. with it being an additional financial revenue stream. Good question. That's a challenging one. I think um, it's important to remember that the, the, the whole field, even though, yes, your vine itself and the trunk itself might only be occupying a very small space, you actually want to encourage a root structure to fill that entire hectare, not just where the row of vines is. So I would be nervous or anxious about trying to overwork the soils. Um, you need that soil and vines are planted at a very specific density. Uh, which we calculate based on the variety, the soil type, etc., to get your optimum use of light and space, etc. Um, and I think it's important not to overwork the soils and, and try and sort of rinse that field too much. Um, you need to give back a fair bit so that those vines can um, spread their roots and actually let those roots touch in the middle from one row to the next. So um, in terms of what you can do for your, your field and for the environment, etc., cetera, um, having green cover on the ground, sinking lots of carbon is great. Obviously, as you say, vines are only uh, in leaf for, for a few months of the year, not the entire season. But if you can have green cover throughout the year underneath the vines and never, ever have bare soil, um, then that would be sinking lots of carbon, which is great. That's one of the building blocks of, of life, of course, and really important for the carbs and sugars inside the vine. In terms of financial perspective, I think I would utilize things like the sidelands or headlands for things like that, perhaps, rather than in the vineyard itself. Um, even otherwise, even it might be to the de detriment of the vines. Sorry? Even mid rows, like your brassica mix you put in. If it's for a specific reason to improve the soil structure or to help the vines, like say you need to improve your drainage or say you need to fix more nitrogen with, with legumes, um, then I would do that and it's a valuable tool to improve the vineyard th th itself. Um, but I would be quite weary of actually taking something away. So we, we like to you know, mulch in that biomass at the end of the season or during the year at specific times. We like to cut the clover to release a bit of nitrogen or, or something like that. Um, but I'd be weary of actually sowing a full-on crop and then taking that out the field because then right. what you take away, somebody needs to put it back. Something needs it to go back it's in. It's more looking at uh. from October through to April, mm -hmm. that vine isn't in leaf. How in mid-rows can we sow a mix, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. that is regenerative for that soil, is mm -hmm. at different rooting depths, and also has a financial kickback. Good question. And is then mowed in, yeah. mowed in in spring. Oh, I see. So if there's a financial kickback, I guess it would have to be like something a stewardship scheme or similar. Yeah, wildflower if mixes if or on, on forty mixes hectares, if you've got bee lines or if you're yeah. two meter row spacings, you know, you're talking yeah. fifteen hectares at six fifty, mm. six hundred fifty pounds a hectare for land that's not going to be financially accruing over winter. So I, I, I think you have to look at it in, sorry, in, in, in terms of um, you're going to have a healthier crop, you're going to have more interesting wine because it's, it's coming from, the, y you want to produce a, 
uh, or, or whoever's making the wine wants to produce a, a complex wine, but that will only come from a complex soil. So, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to put figures on it, but I'm, I'm a s real believer that the, the healthier, the more diverse soil which you will get by using a cover crop in the winter um, will produce more interesting flavours in the grapes. I, I was going to suggest, I'm not an arable farmer, but I was going to suggest winter barley. Mm. Possibly. Uh, I, I have seen beer. vineyards use um, some winter, winter barley and uh, grazing rye. oats and rice. So kale, what, what's that one? Oh, yeah, I can't remember. Um, but what we found is obviously that they're, they're taking quite a lot away from the soil. And at that time of the year, even though the vine's not in leaf, it's often still um, the roots can be active in, in the autumn and the spring. And that's when you need those nutrients available to the vines. And you, you know, whatever you're doing, you have to have a very calculated approach and not to the detriment of the vine. So you've just got to be careful what you're, you're doing there. I think something, just coming back to Hugo's point as well, um, and linking back to Vinescapes, is um, you guys are currently um, researching at the moment the effect of quality or regenerative uh, viticulture on quality. So, I mean, then you, if you've got better quality wines, you obviously will be able to get a better price for them. So I think once that research is there, and I think already, the, am I right that it's kind of showing that there is better quality from... Uh, y yes, it is, and we've um, outside of this study, we've we've actually seen it in so many many sites where the winemakers generally have just fed back and gone, oh well, where was that fruit from? Because that was awesome, and we found that it was often from the regen sites, or nine nine times out of ten. Um, but yes, we're we're busy doing so. We do a lot of research as well, and um, we're working with Naya BMR, who have a, a, a place at East, East Malling with a vineyard. We're doing some trials there and also with some uh, friendly vineyards at Gusbourne and at Chapel Down, working with them to establish uh, what kind of effects cover crops can have on wine quality, not just soil health and, and tilth and all of the rest of it, but on wine quality itself and what, what, what kind of plants can we plant as companions to our vines to manipulate the actual wine quality, the flavours and potentially the yields. So. That trial's been running for a year so far. Unfortunately, last year was very dry, so it was quite hard to get some of the cover crops to establish on some of their drier sites. Um, and I believe it's going to be extended into the next year and possibly an, an, a third so that we can get more representative results. So we look forward to, to sharing those when we get the, the, the feedback. Great. Does that answer your question vague, vaguely? Great. I think those at the back. Oh. Um, would the main points of advice made today differ for New World wineries. So, for example, we have a small vineyard in South Africa where it's difficult to get a green cover crop all year round. Uh, would any of the main points of advice differ? I, I actually grew up in South Africa on a, on a wine estate, so <laughs> might be able to help. Um, interestingly, my, my father's vineyard was on a very, very dry, sandy site uh, near s in a small town called Wellington, near Stellenbosch. And uh, he never irrigated it once and never suffered from drought stress. And that's because he was a very lazy farmer. He never cut his grass. <laughs> he never sprayed any herbicides ever, mostly just through neglect. And uh, he was more focused on kind of distilling and things like that. So wasn't that bothered about quality. And so decided to just kind of neglect the vineyard a bit, if I'm honest. But that really worked in his favor. And it actually taught me a lot as a kid about um, nature and, and uh, how not messing with it can help improve it. So there, he, he didn't necessarily have lush green grass between the rows, no, because extreme droughts most of the summer and very little winter rainfall um, as well. But anyway, where I'm going with this was his soils became really, really healthy because he never sprayed his vineyard. He was too lazy. He barely did any mowing ever unless it was you know, too tall to harvest the fruit. And as a result, that matting across the soil surface actually retained so much moisture um, that the ground was often a bit damper, and that was better. Uh, but also what we found was that the roots were incredibly deep. I mean, six, seven, eight, nine, and even 10 meters deep, which was fantastic. And that's because he never irrigated them like all of his neighbors. And so they were forced to dig down looking for water and at the same time unlocking so much more nutrition, which was great, lots of minerality. Sorry, it's been a long few days. Um, and uh, that we found was actually, he instilled so much resilience in that vineyard, frankly by mistake, but it worked. And that vineyard is, it's about 60 years old now and still cropping really, really well, really consistently. And you know, he's happy, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> he's unfortunately, he's now sold it and moved to Kenya, but yeah. Um, I went to the uh, Regen Viticulture 
a session yesterday and uh, someone shared a slide, and I, I could have been Simon from Pencroft, I can't remember. Um, because we've had a strange uh, growing season this year, we had a lot of rain in February and March and then it went completely dry and everyone's um, grass and, and weeds or whatever it is you've got in your intervine row has it's, it's been taller than we would normally expect. Um, and so they actually, uh, instead of mowing it, because it was getting caught in the mower, they just rolled it. And so it's forming a kind of a matting. And, and they think that's a really good way, particularly if you've got a very dry climate, to, to keep that moisture in. So don't, don't mow, perhaps try rolling if, when you've got your, when you do have some uh, greenery. And um, cr crimping is really good for that as well. But I don't know, cr crimping roller maybe, but it had been yeah. Nice. Uh, and I think I think being I think being lazy is quite quite an important aspect <laughs> because n one's natural. If you've got a, if you, one's natural um, instinct, very often is actually to do something because it makes you feel better because you've done something. But actually, sometimes the best thing to do is to do nothing. <laughs> I totally agree with that. <laughs> um, perfect. And then I think just oh, a couple more questions. So um, my neighbours have just planted a uh, conventional vineyard, so it's all totally bare soil at the moment, and they're just starting to plant, they're just starting to grow the vines. Um, and I'm quite keen to convince them to go regenerative instead, because um, they're right at the start of the journey, and they're kind of open to advice, but they're very conventional farmers. Um, so where would you go from that point, having start starting with just bare soil? Um, I would wait. That's what we always do, do nothing. first. <laughs> yeah, yeah un no, honestly, because um, often what you find is that the as soon as you make that soil bare once, if it was you know farmed intensively or, or perhaps they were arable or similar, often what you find as soon as you take away all of that crop and then you plant your vines and it's kind of a, a bare open field, so many seeds, that natural bank of seeds that will be in that soil will come through. And often you find that that's actually diverse enough and suitable for the site and will do the job you want. So I'm a firm believer, I mean, I'm very pro cover cropping in certain situations where you find, okay, I need a brassica mix to actually till down and, and, and improve my structure. But if, if the plants that come through naturally are suitable and diverse enough, leave them be. And, and that's what we normally do first, is just wait, let them come up, assess what's there. If that's good, leave it. I, um I work with orchards in that area and it just feels like so often nettles and brambles come up that is that not a risk? They might and in that case you might consider spot treating so um, you know either hand pulling or um, keep them topped at a certain height for example just to take away their, their seed heads if they're taller growers and often they are the nettles the thistles often shoot up quite quickly fat hen as well can do the same and if those are the weeds that you don't necessarily want, you want perhaps want some other plants, then cut to a certain height. Sorry, cut to a certain height when um, they're about to go to seed to prevent them reseeding. And then often you'll find the more um, favourable plants will come through anyway. Any other advice to add, Hugo? Liv? No, I think I think you know just <laughs> just <laughs> uh, let let nature prevail and see what happens. Great. I think there are a couple more questions still. Um, so if we head over here. Could, could I ask where you are in the debate on whether to really push for an early first harvest in the, in the first three years, or whether it's better to let the vines grow um, and, and gain more strength before you encourage the first harvest? Shall I go? Or well, uh, uh, absolutely. Let, uh, again, let nature, don't push them. Get them to put their energies into the in, into the roots. Get them established. Don't go for a quick fix to get cash in quickly. When you're doing your budgeting, allow for the fact that you're not going to get a crop instantly and give the vines a chance to get established. I tend to agree with the approach. If you cross your I's and dot your T's and you've got the right vines in the right place and you manage them well and your canopy management pruning, etc., is on point, get your viticulture right as well, of course, and we haven't really spoken about viticulture all that much, we've spoken about soil. Um, but when you cross your eyes, dot your T's, get your viticulture right, you can take a crop in year three, but not a big one. It's usually about 30% of your ultimate um, maximum yields or optimum yields. Year four, usually about 50 to 60% of ultimate yields, and then uh, year five or six, you're up to sort of fully, fully cropping. 
Um, but what I will say is make data-driven decisions. So understand your vines, understand uh, what their vigor is telling you, what their growth patterns are telling you, and then decide whether they're able to handle that crop or not. Um, and if you're unsure, ask someone who is sure, because getting it wrong can, can come back to haunt you uh, the year after. Liz, what's, been, what's your experience been of when you've been able to take a crop from the vineyards you've planted? Well, we planted our 11,000 vines in one year. So um, we did take a, a very small crop in, in year three. Um, I think it was only about two tonne. Uh, uh, you know, and we've had 24 ton in that, so it was it was smaller than than you're even suggesting, and and they were great. Those those grapes were great, and and the vines didn't seem to suffer from that. I w I wouldn't um, take any sooner than that. Definitely, I don't think. Uh, and you think you you've invested in that vineyard, and and you're hoping the perennial crop that those vines will be there for 20 or 30 years or more, whatever. I don't know. 100. So it's worth waiting. It's definitely worth waiting a little bit longer. Right, and then I think there's a question at the back. Um, I'm an organic uh, arable farmer in Wiltshire, and I uh, got put in touch with a guy called Stephen Skelton uh, yeah, to come and have a look at the uh, site and all the rest of it, and I can see you're laughing. Um, he, he talked me out of uh, organic um, viticulture uh, because he said that the yield uh, differential just made the whole thing not stack up, and I just thought it was a great opportunity with two organic um, uh, vineyard owners just to kind of counter his my organic sites crop exactly the same as my conventional sites and uh, I mean I've I don't I, I, I read what he says and and um, but he uh, he just ha he's just not interested he's ju his mindset um, is just just completely different and he and you won't change him you know, he's he's. But in your experience, you, it does work. It's totally. Function, I guess. Fine. And Hugo is in Wiltshire, so <laughs> maybe can uh, this gentleman come and see you and ask you? Of course, can. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's another, another question at the front here. It's a kind of multi-pronged um, question about vineyard establishment. Have you look? Have you done any plantings that are just of rootstock that will establish roots? potentially at a quicker and deeper rate than grafted vines and then grafted on at a later date. And we'll start there. The second one is for regenerative viticulture, do you think a higher trellising system is more favorable such that you can have probably more extensive ground cover than if you've got lower trellising systems? Two very good questions. Excellent, I like this. Um, so yes, rootstocks. We haven't trialed it, but from experience, um, grafting is very hard. I did a lot as a kid uh, with my father. It's, 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 it's not that challenging to get grafting right, but it's very, very temperature dependent uh, for successful uh, take of those buds. I don't think the UK is quite hot enough yet to actually get that right. Um, I've done you know, loads of grafting at home and in the garden and things where, <coughs> excuse me, where you can control the climate, it will work, sure. Out in the field, it's very high risk, and what we found across other people who have tried it around the UK, they tend to get sort of 20 to 40 percent success rate, which, frankly, that's a losing battle. Um, so no, I wouldn't plant rootstock first and then graft later. I'd, I'd rather graft to order. Plus, <coughs> excuse me, there's a, there's enough science to back up and enough data and experience to back up what varieties, what rootstock work, and we've never had an issue with with uh, establishment at all as long as um, the soils are healthy or the ground is prepped then no, no problem there. Refresh me, second question. Oh, uh, tall trellising. I think it, it depends on the site. One of the complications with the taller systems is they're very labor intensive. Needless to say, thanks to Brexit, it's a bit challenging to get more staff in the fields. And frankly, most of the UK population don't really want to work in vineyards uh, or, or work very hard in vineyards, is my experience. Um, that's just the truth of it. But yeah, if you, if you can, I mean, the reason why people push towards the VSP system was you can mechanize more of it. Um, the taller trellising systems are harder to mechanize because of the nature of their growth patterns. But uh, from a purely regen point of view, if I was going to buy a pot of land for myself and plant a vineyard on it, I'd probably go for either Geneva Double Curtain or the Watson system, with the, which are both taller. A few reasons why. One is um, <coughs> taller trunk means higher cordon. So if you did have a frost risk, you're slightly higher up and a little bit less likely to get 
actual frost damage, which is great. That's one of our biggest nemeses. So avoiding that, brilliant. Number two, um, if you can train your <coughs> in Geneva double curtain, I don't know if you can visualize that picture earlier, the, the canopy was hanging downwards and that meant that the base of the shoots were actually pointing right into the sun, really good exposure to light and, and um, temperatures, which is fantastic for fertility in terms of bud fruit and bud initiation for the following year. So what I really like about GDC is that those, um, those basal buds, which are going to generate next year's crop, are in the sun and the light, which means that we can actually, uh, those vines lend themselves to spur pruning, which is actually a lot quicker and more effective than, than cane replacement pruning, if you can get it right. Um, whereas VSP vines tend to be better suited to cane replacement. So from that perspective, I really like that as well. Then from a, a ground cover perspective, yes, if you're able to have a slightly taller system, you can grow more plants underneath, let them get a little bit taller. However, uh, you do still find issues with airflow as that canopy comes down, starts to get closer to the soil, and your cover crop comes up, you end up with this sort of, um, sort of snakes airflow pattern, which is actually challenging to deal with. Whereas with the uh, VSP vines, you can have a lot more airflow underneath the vines and just keep your cover crop slightly more managed in terms of height. You know, you don't have to mow to the floor. You can mow a foot off the ground, and that's that's totally fine. So, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. There are, there are pros and cons to, to both. Liz, Hugo, do you have anything to add? Um, I think you're both VSP. Yeah, yeah. we're VSP. Um, but I thought, I might be wrong, that um, Geneva Double Curtain, those taller ones, are more suitable for um, to be growing on saws that have got uh, you know, good quality saw deep saws with maybe a lot of nitrogen that you uh, that you can, uh, you know, utilize that to, to plant less. Is that is that right? W would you use it on a generally? High high yes, I suppose. But we we've, we've come a long way in terms of rootstock choices and things like okay, that, where we can yes. now find more. I think rootstock root choice sites. is actually probably more important, mm. I I in my view, than mm. perhaps you know, th th your canopy management. Um, we have a variety called Savoir Blanc, which I know a lot of people grow in the UK. It's got good disease resistance to mildew. Um, and we've got, I think, about two rows which are on a different rootstock than uh, uh, the rest of them because when we ordered, I think we, we did it wrong. We, 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 um, we decided to plant a vineyard, got very excited and just didn't get enough knowledge and planted rather quicker than we should have done. Um, so we took a percentage of our Sable Blanc on a different rootstock than we would have liked. And those two rows in most years, they st really struggle with a cold spring and they get almost quite orange leaves. Um, the rest of us are, are on SO4 and I think that's something called gra grab sack. Is that grab sack? Um, and, and we notice that unless it's a really warm spring, we, we don't crop very well from those two rows. So f for us, it's, it's the choice of rootstock more than perhaps the the training method, I don't know. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's absolutely key. We're on, we're on chalk, and there's only one rootstock which will tolerate it, and that's Furcal. Unfortunately, there were some vines which were delivered which weren't on Furcal, and we've got a real problem with them. And I'm now beginning to think that there's only about six rows. I think I'm probably going to grub them up and just replant them because it's an uphill battle. Great. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Any final questions? Cool. I think that's time. Thanks so much for joining us all. Thank you.